Hi, this is Dr. A with a clinical chemistry review on blood gas analysis. We're going to look at how we uh, measure blood gases. <clears throat> All right, blood gas analysis, uh, we use arterial punctures, uh, and those are the arterial blood then is used to evaluate the pH, oxygen content, and carbon dioxide content of blood, and other parameters too. Um, it is usually collected from the radial artery, although brachial collection is also possible. Uh, at least that's um, all the two main sites that we can collect as uh, phlebotomists or lab techs or respiratory therapists. Doctors can also collect femoral samples, but uh, that's beyond what uh, regular um, techs are allowed to do. Capillary specimens can also be performed on infants, so it can be capillary blood gases, um, and both do require special collection procedures. And most institutions, the respiratory department is responsible for both collection and analysis, but um, some clinical laboratories also perform the collection and analysis on blood gases. It really depends on the institution that you work at. Arterial blood is the specimen of choice because it reflects the oxygenation of the lungs, uh, and that's what you're trying to assess with blood gas analysis. There are pre-package collection kits. Uh, there are um, some collection kits for capillary draws on infants and other prepackaged kits for the ABG collections, which usually in include a self-filling syringe, which means that if you pull back on the plunger, you it actually doesn't generate um, like suction. So uh, you can you can pull back on the plunger a little bit to assist it to fill, but you, you just don't expect there to be any kind of suction. Uh, so it self fills the pressure of the arterial blood pushes the blood into the syringe and moves the the plunger if you will uh, and it has a correct amount of heparin added um, and usually the there's a uh, on the syringe is a circle around the two you usually don't want to collect any more than the two meals uh, in there and um, there's also a, a small rubber cap and some kits have a 23 gauge uh, or higher needle included in it some kids don't the rubber cap is for uh, after you remove the you shield and remove the needle then you can put the rubber cap on it uh, after you've removed any kind of air bubbles and stuff some kids also have a local anesthetic to decrease the pain but uh, not all of them obviously uh, proper collection is essential obviously uh, a tourniquet cannot be used because the stasis of blood would lower the ph and the po2 the anticoagulant of choice, of course, is heparin, as mentioned, um, and uh, make sure that um, the heparin is well mixed into the sample so the sample doesn't clot. Time and temperature uh, are also an important factor. So after collection, any excess air has to be expelled from the sample immediately. So do that before you put the rubber cap on. Once the collection is complete and any air is expelled, the sample should be mixed by rolling the syringe in the collector's hands and place on ice. You don't want to try to shake it up or anything like that. So roll it to mix that heparin in and then put it on ice unless you're right there by the analyzer and you can analyze it immediately. So uh, once on ice, the sample can be stable for one hour and at room temperature, the stability can, uh, will decrease to 30 minutes. So some of the basic concepts of blood gas analysis. So saturation is a percentage of hemoglobin molecules whose binding sites are filled with oxygen. Uh, partial pressure, the partial pressure is the amount of pressure contributed by a gas to the total pressure. Uh, and we measure PO2 and uh, so it's partial pressure of O2 and partial pressure of CO2 in blood gases. <clears throat> and the units of measure are always millimeters of mercury. Dalton's law says that uh, partial pressure of a mixture of gases is the sum of the partial pressures that make up the mixture. So it's pretty easy there. And for blood gases, uh, oxygen, carbon dioxide, all the gases in the mixture. And then Henry's law says the amount of gas dissolved in a solution is directly proportional to the partial pressure of the gas. For the measurement, there are some uh, parameters that are directly measured. Those are pH, PO2, and pCO2. And there are some calculated parameters, bicarb, carbonic acid, and the total CO2. Um, and also, if the blood gas has a cooximeter, um, so there's usually also the spectrophotometry, the determination of oxygen saturation. So the actual percent hemoglobin can be determined using the cooximeter, and it's designed to measure various hemoglobin species. Uh, each hemoglobin species has a characteristic absorbance curve, 
and um, so it can use different wavelengths to to hit that uh, correct absorbance. The number of wavelengths incorporated into the cooximeter determines the number of species of hemoglobin that can be measured from four to even hundreds of different species. Um, the four most common hemoglobin species that are measured by cooximetry are going to be deoxyhemoglobin, oxyhemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, and methemoglobin. Um, potential sources of errors are going to be faulty instrument calibration and then spectral interfering substances, those things that might uh, interfere with uh, the spectrum with absorbance and stuff like that, so it would be color interferences. Blood gas analyzers do measure the PHP, CO2, and PO2 with electrodes. Um, so the PO2 electrode is a Clark electrode um, with an oxygen permeable membrane. Um, it is an amperometric measurement, so it measures the amount of current flow, which indicates the oxygen present. Uh, so the PO2 of the Clark electrodes measure the amount of current flow in a circuit, and it is related to the amount of O2 being reduced at the cathode. The sources of error for a PO2 electrode are buildup of protein material on the surface of the membrane, bacterial contamination within the measuring chamber. So those are two sources of error. And um, there's also continuous measurement for PO2 that are possible using a transcutaneous electrode that is placed directly on the skin. Uh, so this is a Clark electrode, so a representation of a Clark electrode. And so um, the it has a gas permeable membrane, so uh, the um, oxygen can uh, interact here at the gas permeable membrane. And so we have a platinum cathode and the silver anode and electrolyte buffer. And so these are the reactions that are occurring. And if you will track, so the silver is going to... Um, oxidize and give up these four electrons here um, and then it's going to combine with chloride here to pick up these neutralize these ions but these four electrons are going to flow to the cathode where they're going to interact here with oxygen so every oxygen molecule that crosses over here at the cathode or that, that interacts here at the cathode is going to pick up four electrons and be reduced here and then um, you can see it picks up water and gives these four hydroxides and then um, these guys here will combine with hydrogen to make more water the chloride here from these electrolyte buffers combined with the silver to make silver chloride um, but this this flow of electron from the anode to the cathodes so knowing that every o2 molecule picks up four electrons you can then calculate with the flow of electrons the, the more flow of electrons going on, the more O2 is present in the sample. The pH electrode and the pCO2 electrode are uh, potenti potentiometric electrodes. So um, the change in voltage between the two reference electrodes indicate the NKZ anal analyte activity, uh, which is the ion that's being measured. They are different types of uh, ion selective uh, potentiometric electrodes. But um, here for the pH ion of interest is going to be hydrogen ions. Uh, and the membrane of the electrode will dictate which analyte gets measured, which, um, which ion it, it interacts with. Uh, a glass membrane is what's used in a pH electrode. It separates the sample from a buffer solution, and the glass membrane only allows the hydrogen ions to interact. And then it creates an ion force measurement uh, that which requires two electrodes, the indicator, which is in the sample, and then the reference electrode and a volt voltmeter to uh, measure that potential difference. So the potential difference between the two electrodes, between the indicator that's with the sample and the reference one, is related to the concentration of the ion of interest, and that is calculated by the Nernst equation. Uh, and uh, so the potential difference will correspond to the pH of the sample because it's going to be related to the hydrogen ion concentration, which is then, of course, related to the pH. Um, I'll show you a diagram here in a second. And then the PCO2 electrode is just a modified pH electrode. And but it allows it has a membrane that allows carbon uh, dioxide that diffuses across the membrane into a sodium bicarb solution. And then that causes the production of hydrogen ions. Uh, hydrogen ions being produced changes the pH and uh, that will correspond to the level of carbon dioxide. So the more carbon dioxide 
the more hydrogen ions are produced, then the lower the pH. And so um, that can be correlated back to the carbon, uh, carbon dioxide concentration. So this one right here is the pH electrode. So you have the pH sensitive class membrane. And with the hydrogen ions here, uh, there's a flow of ions going on and that is going to create a voltage difference between this electrode, which is gonna be the uh, um, electrode that's interacting with the sample and then the reference electrode. And then uh, this one is a modified version of the pH electrode. Uh, its addition is that it has a gas permeable membrane that uh, is going to uh, allow the CO2 only to cross over and then to generate uh, the, um, it's going to generate here this hydrogen ions and then that will change the pH in proportion to the amount of CO2 gas that's present. The, um, the different sensors are available. There are um, micro electrode electrochemical sensors. Those have been used in blood gas instruments since the beginning of clinical measurement of blood gases. This is a representation of those. Um, so they were kind of bigger and bulkier and stuff. And then, of course, like everything else, as we've modernized, modernized it, we've miniaturized it. So we have micro electrodes. So they're just mini versions of the micro electrode. And then there's also thick and thin film technology. There are sensors that are, or tiny wires that are embedded in printed circuits that are disposable. Uh, so that's um, some of the bedside ABG analyzers and all that will have something of the sort, uh, maybe either micro or thick and thin film technology. Uh, and then optical sensors also exist. They use fluorescent dyes in, uh, to which the sample diffuses and they've been applied to indwelling blood gas systems. So um, a few things to think about with calibration and everything. First of all, pH and blood gas measurements are extremely sensitive to temperature and the electrode chambers have to be maintained at constant temperature. Ideally, obviously, they're going to be uh, measured at normal body temperature. It's going to be 37 Celsius. The pH electrode is calibrated with two buffer solutions that are traceable to standards prepared by the NIST. The, then you also have two gas mixtures that are used to calibrate for the PCO2 and the PO2. So you should have two cylinders there, usually nearby, connected to the ABG analyzer, and those are used to calibrate. And then they can be, <coughs> if they're empty, they have to be changed out. Most instruments are self-calibrating and are programmed to indicate a calibration error if there's any kind of uh, electronic signal from the electrodes is inconsistent with what is supposed to be going on, um, which is again another reason why um, our respiratory therapists can can run these blood gases and all that because these analyzers are self calibrating, and they take little intervention from uh, a lab tech for them to be uh, accurate and stuff. So. The calculated parameters are bicarb. So uh, the bicarb is going to be based on the henderson hasselbalch equation, and it can be calculated when the pH and the pCO2 are known. Carbonic acid concentration can be calculated using the solubility coefficient of CO2 in plasma at 37 degrees Celsius. And total carbon dioxide content is the bicarb plus the dissolved CO2 plus the CO2 associated with the proteins. Uh, by convention, the pH, pCO2, and PO2, again, are all measured at 37 degrees Celsius, which is normal body temperature. But if the patient's body temperature differs, so if they're, it could be really cold if we had a hypothermic patient or hot, or hot if they're running at a fever, the blood gas instrument can be, uh, you can enter the temperature and can correct the values, um, but the results at 37 should always be reported to uh, for reference. A few things on quality assurance, uh, a few pre-analytic consideration. Obviously, you want to properly identify your patient before you stick them. Uh, and then once you have drawn the specimen, you want to make sure it is correctly labeled and accurate information is provided. Uh, some of the things that need to be collected when you draw a blood gas, um, other than the patient information and identifiers, might be the site of collection. So right or left radial or right or left brachial and uh, the amount of oxygen therapy the patient might be on. So that, those are relevant. Uh, obviously, this has to be done by experienced, knowledgeable professionals. Uh, the personnel has to be trained to do this. Um, they have to be trained in proper collection and handling of blood gas specimens. So again, 
with the rolling of the specimen to mix to heparin. Make sure you don't lose the little heparin tablets. Um, make sure you let the syringe self-fill using appropriate gauge needles, all of that. Um, make sure that any air bubbles are expelled, that the specimen's put on ice if there's going to be any delay in measurement, all of these things. So all of that has to happen correctly. And transport time, you don't want to delay. This is usually something you want to um, collect and then run right away. The sources of error, um, the collection device uh, could, it's usually a syringe, so uh, if there's any problems with the collection device, that could be a source of error. The form and concentration of the heparin used for anticoagulation also could be a potential source of error if you have too much or too little blood to the heparin. Uh, the speed of syringe filling, so normally it should fill pretty steadily. If you're having problems getting it to fill, you may have problems with it clotting and stuff like that. Uh, maintenance of the anaerobic environment, so making sure again that you expel those air bubbles and stuff after collections. Uh, and if you introduce uh, a lot of air bubbles during collection, it could be a problem. Um, and then mixing of the sample to ensure the dissolution and distribution of that heparin and the transport and storage time before analysis. Uh, those are all sources of errors and things that you want to be mindful of when you do blood gases. And that is your last slide. Thank you for your attention.